Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for waiting, uh, and welcome to today's webinar on the CDMRPs, the Congressionally Directed Medical Research Programs. My name is Jonathan Adelist. I'm the head of business development at the Freemind Group, uh, and I'll be speaking with you today on this topic. Um, before we get going, a few things. First of all, this is being recorded uh, and will be up on our YouTube channel, so um, feel free to uh, check that out or share it with anybody you think may be interested um, further down the line. And also, I will be sending out an email with a link to that uh, recording on YouTube uh, to everybody who registered to the webinar. I will also be sending out um, uh, the, the deck that I'm using today, but actually, if you're currently here, uh, you can just grab the deck uh, in the handout section uh, of of the of the menu of the, of the GoToWebinar menu. Uh, I've uploaded it as a PDF there, and you can just grab it from there right, right now if you'd like to to use that while I'm speaking. That's uh, absolutely fine. Um, questions? Uh, I'll be taking them at the end of of, of the today's talk. Uh, so feel free if anything comes up. Uh, during the talk to just type those in to the chat section and I will try to address as many of them as possible towards the end. Um, okay, I think that that's that's good. So let's going. Let's get going. Um, by way of a background, the Freemind Group is obviously a consulting firm and we help our clients basically raise money from this type of source, non dilutive funding. Um, We've been around for about 20 years, not quite, just almost 20 years, uh, 70 full-time employees at the moment. We work across the life sciences, all the way up from tiny seed stage startups up to some of the largest companies out there, and also, obviously, academics, uh, academic institutes, medical research centers, things like that. Uh, currently submit 500 to 550 applications a year. And, and really the way we go about maximizing our clients' potential for funding is, is, is through a very systematic approach. And, and we start by really identifying everything that is relevant for what that client is engaged in and what the activities they're looking to fund are. We strategize and we really help maximize each application's chances of success by understanding the, the trends and the interests of the funding agency beyond just what's kind of stated in, in the official call for applications because we've doing this, been doing this for quite a while now. We do have that type of uh, knowledge and, and, and that's something that we find very helpful as well. Um, we help manage you know, complex uh, projects, multi-PI, multi-faceted applications as well. We, we typically are, are the hub of all the activities in, when putting all of that together. Uh, we obviously lead the application writing as well, although obviously you know, we do need cooperation on that. Uh, and we also support uh, contract negotiations and things like that, the submission itself, uh, when all of those things are relevant. Um, and in general, we view ourselves uh, as a strategic financial tool uh, to help maximize the possibility of raising funds from this type of source. And what, what is really this type of source? So basically, non-dilutive funding is a pocket of money that's available. Uh, and, and in many cases, uh, a lot of people in the industry are not really aware of the magnitude of this source of funding. So to put it in perspective, this pocket of money is currently about 50, slightly even over $50 billion a year, with a B, uh, that's, that's allocated to research and development, specifically uh, from our perspective in the life sciences. Uh, and that spans various different Gundy, uh, government agencies and also some uh, private foundations. Um, and today what we'll dis be discussing, uh, obviously, is the congressionally directed medical research programs. Um, but in general, this type of funding, uh, and I think it's important to understand the, the importance and the, and the real impact that this type of funding can have. Uh, and this is based on a paper about uh, six years ago from the, from the Milken Institute. Um, uh, and basically, they looked into the long-term returns on investment uh, and, and the effects of, uh, specifically, they looked into NIH funding. But this is probably fairly applicable to other uh credible, significant sources of funding like, like the DOD. Um, and, and they found that uh, for a company that raised public funding for every dollar uh, that they were able to receive, the long-term value of that dollar was actually $8.38. Uh, 
and, and much of that comes from the validation that comes with this type of approval that yes, this is top-notch science, we have NIH funding, we have DOD funding for our projects. People really value that. Uh, and actually from the perspective of the funders, in this case the government, there's also a real return on investment here. Uh, obviously they don't gain any direct revenue from, from the money because they don't get, gain any IP, there's no typically any royalties or anything like that, it's definitely not a loan. Um, but uh, the way it's viewed uh, typically is, is as a way to reduce the healthcare burden and, and, and it's, uh, the calculations came up to for every dollar uh, that they had invested in this type of research, the effects of that, and obviously this is something that's fairly complicated to calculate, but they estimate uh, that the actual ROI was $2.3 for every dollar, meaning that, they, that it's actually a very logical investment on, the, on behalf of the government. Um, an interesting statistic also uh, is uh, if you look historically at all of the drugs that received FDA approval, 50% of them received government funding at some point during their development. Uh, now there's obviously a chicken and egg issue here or kind of a catch-22 where it's, it's not entirely fair to say that, you know, it's because they got government funding. Obviously, you know, maybe the government funding gave them the push that they needed to succeed, but also maybe from the get-go, it was amazing science that would eventually end up with government funding because it's great and also arrive at the market because it's great. So the truth is it's probably a bit of the two, but regardless, I think the important understanding here may be that if you are able to secure that type of funding, you validated yourself at a, at a very different position with relation to your chances of reaching the market. Obviously not 50%, uh, depend, depending on the stage of development, but still it is definitely a significant uh, event for the development process of a drug or, or honestly anything else. Uh, so, so diving in a bit more specifically to the CDMRPs, uh, congressionally directed medical research programs are a set of programs that are basically uh, money that is allocated by Congress every year for a specific set of indications. Um, while there are absolutely programs that recur every year, technically they are uh, announced every year de novo, meaning everything could change 2019. There, there, are, there wouldn't necessarily be the exact same programs. We see that most of the programs repeat themselves every year, but Congress does decide every year what those programs will be. Um, generally speaking, the review, review criteria are very similar to the NIH. Uh, unlike many other uh, DOD sources of funding, uh, the process here is actually fairly efficient. Uh, and, and, and you do get responses, in, in most cases, fairly quickly, actually. Um, and uh, something interesting about the CDMRPs is there are no geographical restrictions. Um, applicants can submit f basically from anywhere across the world. The, there is an issue here with, with military relevance, and basically the CDMRPs are, are, are obviously under the Department of Defense. But I think the interesting thing to understand here is that basically their goal uh, is to fund research that has relevance to healthcare needs of the military service members, but also veterans and beneficiaries. And that's that's where a lot of the logic comes in, wherein uh, a lot of the topics that you'll see us discussing uh, later today, uh, well, not that much later, but <laughs> in a few minutes, I guess, um, they wouldn't strike you as DOD topics in many cases. Uh, and, and the reason for that is A, men and women in uniform also, you know, they, they, they fall ill with various different uh, diseases that, that everybody else does. Um, but also the, the DOD is charged with taking care of veterans and the family members of, of the men and women in uniform, things like that. So, so that's the logic behind a lot of the programs. And, and to be clear, you will have to state why this is this, your project has military relevance, and in some cases that can be something very specific that is very very relevant to specific situations or specific indications that are very very re much related to the actual active military duty. 
Um, but that's not always the case at all. And, and we've had a lot of success stories with, with the, in cases where, where the military relevance, and obviously I'm exaggerating here, but was something along the lines of people uh, in the army get lung cancer too. And, and there is an actual lung cancer program. Um, so obviously you know, that's, you know, that's not how we phrase it and it's not how I would suggest you phrase it. Uh, and you do have to know how to construct the military relevance uh, argument. Um, but I guess the bottom line here is that you shouldn't be discouraged by your project not being something that's specifically relevant to the military, uh, so long as you know how to construct a good uh, argument as to why it could benefit men and women in uniform or even veterans and, and, and beneficiaries, as mentioned. Um, in terms of, of, of looking at the actual solicitations, uh, so, so the CDMRP website is actually uh, fairly user-friendly. Uh, it's cdmrp.army.mil. Um, one issue with the website is that it's typically not easy to access from outside the United States. Yeah, but other than that, uh, it, it, it's a fantastic website. And actually, if you're not in the United States, either if you're based outside the U.S., because as I mentioned, non-U.S. applicants are, are absolutely accepted, or if you're traveling or anything like that, uh, a good way to look at the open solicitations is uh, through the EBRAP website, uh, E-B-R-A-P. Um, but uh, the, the only things you'll be able to see there are the current open applications. So pre-announcements, previous years, things like that are, would only be available on the actual CDMRP website. Uh, uh, so obviously, if you are in the U.S., it's, it's much easier to use that. Uh, to kind of summarize the current situation, uh, so the CDMRP's budget for this year is just shy of, of $1 billion. So a very significant source of funding. Not, not quite the NIH, obviously, which is about $30 billion, over actually about $34. Um, but a very significant source of, of, of funding, $1 billion in, in, in funding for research and development, specifically in, in medical research. Um, and, and the way that's allocated is, is there's kind of a list here I added on the side of all of the different programs. Uh, but in terms of the, the money that's been allocated, so you can see there are some areas with, with very significant funding, 130 million for breast cancer, uh, 100 million for prostate cancer, spinal cord injuries, 30 million. Um, in general, uh, the, 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 excuse me, the general medical research that I've, I've listed here is 330 million is actually something called the peer reviewed medical research program. And we'll dive in a bit deeper in a few minutes, but generally speaking, there's a, a fairly long list of about 50, slightly over 50 different indications that are all under the same umbrella here. So that's why, uh, there, there's a, a very high dollar amount associated with that. It's actually, uh, divided, uh, among, uh, over 50 different topic areas, but, uh, that it's not specifically pre-allocated between them. So if one year they get a lot of good applications on one topic, the funding for that topic may be significantly higher than one of the other topics. It's not pre-allocated per topic. Um, generally speaking, in terms of the, the mechanism and how it works, so it's uh, it's basically there there are two stages uh, to uh, to the CDMRPs. You initially start with a pre-application. Uh, white paper, quad chart, uh, generally speaking, this is a very short document, usually two, sometimes three or even five pages, but it's, it's, it's a very you know, limited document. And actually, in many cases, the challenge is actually putting everything you want and kind of into that and, and really summarizing it into the, the, the limited amount of space that you have, unlike Larger applications where obviously it's just, you know, it's, it's about writing and writing and writing. Here it's, it's more, much more editing than writing. Um, but although it's not a huge amount of work because a pre-application, as I mentioned, is, is really just a few pages, uh, it has to be done very, very well because with a few exceptions, and we will actually discuss one of those exceptions, um, this is the major cutoff. Most applications do not progress beyond the pre-application stage. So while, as I mentioned, it, it's not extremely time-consuming, uh, it, it should be very expertly done and you have to really understand what you want in there and what you need to convey with your pre-application. Um, hopefully it's favorably reviewed and you get asked to submit a full application uh, and, and the deadlines for the pre-application and full application are predetermined so you will know uh, when you'll be uh, told that you were accepted to submit a full application and you will know in advance when you need to submit that full application. 
hopefully you're invited and then you kind of hit the ground running because usually you don't have a huge amount of time to submit the full to, to produce the full application um, and and hopefully obviously <laughs> they like the full application and at that point uh, uh, you enter discussions and, and, and receive the award um, Generally speaking, and there's a lot of variability here, to be fair, but I tried to, to kind of create a, a summary or a narrative to the different types of award mechanisms that the CDMRP programs have. And the truth is, each one of the programs I made, uh, that I listed earlier, and I'll, I'll go back up to the lists here just to, so you can uh, kind of look at a few of them. So anything between alcohol and substance abuse, ALS, autism, bone, miller, uh, bone, bone marrow failure, breast cancer, uh, Duchenne, epilepsy, and, and going down the entire list, all of these, each one of them has a separate set of possible awards, but there are generally kind of award type families that I'd like to discuss to give you a general perspective on what you can typically ex uh, expect. And, and the truth is not each, of, each one of the topics or each one of the programs, uh, which is how they're referred to, each one of those topics is an actual program within each program, there are different possible awards. Um, so each one of those programs will not necessarily have all of these example award types. And also there are other award types that I'm not listing here because they're typically less relevant for our client base. There are career development awards, things like that, that I'm not discussing because it's just, I find it to be less relevant both for us and for who I, I would expect to be joining here today. Um, so these are kind of the, a few of the general families of award types that are relatively common and also uh, relatively relevant for for-profit small businesses or, or larger businesses, but our organizations uh, like what really our client base is typically. Um, although obviously we work with academics and this could be very relevant for academics, but the focus here is for-profit businesses. Um, Budgets, I gave an estimate here, uh, which is fairly accurate, but again, you could find as an example going and uh, just looking at, a, let's say, an idea award uh, as an example, you could find one that's 650, you could find one that's 300, uh, but the vast majority would be between 350 and 600,000. Uh, so, so going through the, the different types of awards, uh, discovery award or concept award is, is typically a very, very uh, initial uh, project that they would look to fund. No preliminary data is, is not, not even required. They don't accept typically preliminary data. The goal would be to examine or or even validate, but something that's very, very initial, an interesting concept or, or, or very early discovery work. Um, therefore, it's 100, 100 to $200,000. Um, the next kind of level of funding in general would be idea awards. Usually these are actually similar in the, in, in the, in the respect that they don't necessarily ask for preliminary data, but it, it is kind of slightly more advanced projects. It's not something that you just kind of put an idea together and that's it. Usually it has to be something that's at least slightly more advanced or developed. Uh, uh, still absolutely kind of the, the most advanced project that I would uh, again, depending on the specific program, but usually early preclinical activities are the latest stage of development that this would ever cover. Um, and uh, typically awards here would be, as I mentioned earlier, 350 to 600K. Um, impact awards are awards that are not necessarily for a specific stage of development, although they don't go too early. Um, but the, the point of an impact award is something that really has groundbreaking effects, uh, something that would be truly, um, something that would really change the field if, if you validate your claims. Uh, disruptive research, basically. Um, technically, this is one of the mechanisms that usually you can actually use to fund clinical trials, although because of the dollar amount, uh, obviously this wouldn't really cover a large clinical trial. It's more about validating something with, with extremely important impact and not necessarily funding an entire trial. Um, technology development awards, therapeutic development awards are for relatively advanced research but not clinical trials. So usually preclinical activities and even kind of actually putting together the IND package, things like that, essentially translating something promising into something that is actually moving into the clinic. Um, 
And these awards are anywhere between one and three million dollars usually. And then there are also clinical trial awards, uh, and they vary anywhere anywhere between uh, the, the lower, the, the really the extremely low dollar amount on a clinical trial award would be about a million dollars. And typically, the highest dollar amounts are, are historically with the breast cancer program, and they can be up to ten million dollars d- depending on the technology readiness level uh, or, or really how advanced the program is. Um, Looking into one of the specifically kind of more interesting programs because it's very broad in terms of what it would cover, and this is something I mentioned earlier, uh, the peer-reviewed medical research program. Um, This is actually a program that, if I counted correctly, covers this year 51 indications, (laughs) although um, I don't think counting long lists is something that I would add to my, uh, (laughs) my list of attributes. So uh, if, I, if I counted wrong, this is 50 or 52, please forgive me. Uh, but regardless, um, a very long list of, in, of potential indications, some of them uh, fairly kind of rare and specific. Some of them are, are, are areas that are areas that we, we cover with a lot of our clients, uh, infectious diseases, tissue regeneration, uh, drug delivery, I should say release drug delivery to be exact, respiratory health, IBD, uh, infectious diseases, uh, I, I mentioned earlier, uh, diabetes, uh, congenital heart disease, pain management, uh, arthritis, antimicrobial resistance. So there are a lot of areas here. A lot of them are relatively uh, kind of commonplace in, in, in the industry, and some of them are extremely specific. But regardless, this is a funding mechanism that has a significant budget, as I mentioned, $330 million, uh, and covers a, a pretty wide range of potential indications. Uh, to look specifically at the programs that are relevant, or rather, uh, to be more accurate, at the uh, award mechanisms that are possible through this program. Uh, so there's a, they have a discovery award. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, this is for kind of uh, explore, uh, exploration of, of very innovative new con- uh, concepts or, or a completely untested theory. Uh, and this is up to $200,000 in this case. Um, this is specifically not intended to support the logical progression of an already established line of questioning. So it's really only for new ideas, nothing you've actually moved forward with, it, forward with not for something that you have already kind of massed some data on. It's just, you know, you have, you have a few really nice ideas that you're, you're considering to, to check. Submit a few of these. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, it's something we, we do with a lot of our clients. Um, Especially since this covers a, a, a wide range of indications as well, so this is something that you could you could actually submit a few of in many cases, uh, obviously depending on the specifics. Um, one thing that's worth mentioning here, and th- there will be a few examples with uh, uh, pre-applications that are coming up very very soon. Uh, this pre-application deadline is uh, June fourteenth, uh, which is absolutely very immediate. Um, I will say that if you know what you want to do, a few weeks is much, much more than enough time to to put something like this together because it's only for the pre-application. The challenge in this case, and this is the example I mentioned earlier where where the the pre-application is not really the main cutoff for the full application. With this specific award, and this is usually not the case, but I'm I'm starting with this uh, example regardless, um, everybody can submit a full application. Uh, And therefore, you'll see a very uh, short gap between the pre-application and the full application. So the pre-application is June 14th and the full application is June 28th. Obviously, it's not reviewed uh, in that time period. Uh, So basically, if you want to submit this, you should really hit the ground running, not because of the pre-application necessarily, although that's important, but because of the full application application, to put something like that together in about a month is, is definitely possible. Um, but it means you have to start working <laughs> pretty much now. Um, another award mechanism that they have through uh, the PRMRP, which is the uh, – I may start saying PRMRP instead of peer-reviewed medical research program, so please forgive me um, – is the Technology or Therapeutic Development Award. And I mentioned this earlier. This is up to $3 million. Uh, uh, and and basically, the, the this award is designed – to fund translation of promising preclinical findings into clinical applications, not funding the clinical trials, 
but basically ending in an IND, ending in in, in a situation where you're ready to, to enter the clinic. So putting together the IND uh, package, uh, your preclinical talks, admin, things like that, all of that could be covered uh, through this funding mechanism, as I mentioned, about up to $3 million. It's very product-oriented. These mechanisms, when you see them, the, the development awards uh, within CDMRPs, uh, and maybe I failed to mention this earlier, but these are much more product-oriented usually, uh, and in many ways slightly similar to an SBIR in the fact that they're very business-friendly. Um, the full application here would be September 20th, so as you'll see with uh, – almost all of, well, actually from now on, all of the examples, but in general, almost all of the CDMRPs, there is a time gap between the pre-application and the full application. And whenever you see that, that means, as I mentioned earlier, that the pre-application is a competitive phase and actually, typically it's more competitive than the full application. And they also have a clinical trial award uh, through the, the, through the, the uh, PRMRPs. Uh, and, and this one has no budget cap. Although if you look at uh, the amount of funds allocated specifically for the clinical trial award and the amount of awardees they expect to fund, then the average there is about $6 million per project. Now, that doesn't mean they won't fund an 8 or a $10 million trial. They most definitely may. depends on how much, obviously, they're interested. Uh, but that you know also means that if your trial is $2 million, you shouldn't ask for six. It's, it's They want to use their money wisely and maximize kind of meeting their own priorities and their own goals in the best way possible using those funds. Um, so the average would be about six million, but that is not a budget cap. It's more of kind of where the middle ground is expected to be. Um, and this is basically for implementation of clinical trials. Obviously, with all three of these examples, it has to be relevant for one of the indications I mentioned earlier here within this list. Um, but if it is, uh, and um, as you can see, there are quite a few different areas here, then depending on the stage of development, any one of these could be a fantastic source of funding. Pre-application in this case is also fairly immediately, uh, immediate. It's June 25th, which does give you a bit more time, um, but also for a clinical trial, I would really put in a lot of effort because, you know, you're not talking about $200,000 here. Um, so June 25th, it's, a, again, starting very, very soon on the pre-application would be advised. Uh, and the full application in this case would be September 27th. And, and the PRMRPs is, uh, are actually a good example of something that's actually not the standard. In most cases, and I'll kind of list things down in a couple minutes, uh, most of the different awards within the same program will have very similar deadlines. In this case, as you've seen, uh, one was June 14th for a pre-application, and, and then the full application was 28th. One was June 12th and September 20th, and one was June 25th and September 27th. So each one of them has different deadlines. That's actually not usually the case. Um, another set of programs, or rather a set of awards within one program that I think is worth elaborating on at least slightly is the peer-reviewed cancer research program. Now, there are specific cancer programs as well, as you may have seen earlier. There's the breast cancer program, there's a prostate cancer program, there's the ovarian cancer program, there's the lung cancer program. Uh, um, I'll, I'll touch on the fact that there should be a kidney uh, uh, cancer program be, being released soon. Uh, the breast cancer program I, I've touched on earlier, it has a very high, uh, high dollar amount of awards. That's actually one of the only ones that has two deadlines a year. So the first one of, of this year actually has passed, but typically there's another one in November. So if uh, breast cancer is is uh, an indication that you're um, engaged in research in, um, you're in, in luck with that respect because, it, as I mentioned, all of these programs are typically once a year, breast cancer typically twice a year, and you should be on the lookout for uh, a program with deadlines in November. Um, Obviously not not announced yet. Uh, so going back to to the the peer reviewed cancer research program, um, this year's list of indications of 17 different indications are are, are listed here on this slide. Uh, we find the most useful ones for 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 I guess a high percentage of our oncology related clients would be anything immunotherapy which is obviously a huge topic right now. Pancreatic cancer, blood cancers are always uh, relatively uh, strong areas in terms of the amount of companies that are engaged in research in, in, in that space. But there are various other ones as well here, uh, brain cancer, colorectal, liver, stomach, uh, pediatric cancers, 
uh, things like that. Um, so these are the topics. In terms of the funding mechanisms, I'll also give you a couple examples here. Um, they have an idea award, idea award with special focus, and, and basically this is up to 400,000. As I mentioned earlier, idea awards are for early stage work, and not quite as preliminary as, as a concept award, but very, very early. Um, and as you see here, inclusion of preliminary data is discouraged. So they're not saying if you've advanced in any way, shape, or form, don't submit which is what they said with the previous example of a, of a very early stage award of the, with the, with the um, concept award from the peer-reviewed medical research programs. Uh, but they are saying we don't need preliminary data. Um, if it's a really, really good idea, convey why it's a good idea. Uh, we're not saying you can not have looked into it in the past, but it shouldn't be very advanced in this case, uh, case either. Uh, here, the budget is actually twice what it was for the concept award, so this is 400,000. Um, and the deadline here is June 20th. Again, hit the ground running with the pre-app, but uh, September 26th is definitely far enough in the future for the full application to make sure that you have time to construct it well. Another funding mechanism that I'd like to, to take a quick look at uh, is also part of the peer review cancer research program, and again, Anything on any of those 17 different indications is relevant here, uh, but here in terms of, of, of the scope, they're looking for, as I mentioned earlier, really disruptive research, something that would change the field, be it pancreatic cancer, it's something that would change how patients are being treated, uh, or any of the other indications. Uh, it's The example here is not, let's say, we have a molecule for lung cancer, we want to test it also in pancreatic cancer. That is not what they're looking for with the impact award. They're looking for something that would be disruptive, that's groundbreaking, that has really high impact. Um, this will fund clinical trials, uh, but obviously, you know, the dollar amount is one million dollars, so <laughs> you're not looking at funding for 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 a large trial, obviously. Um, but there's no restriction in terms of the stage of development in that respect. Um, June 20th, again, same uh, pre-application deadline and then a full application uh, September 26th. Um, and I'd like to run by you uh, so you don't miss them. Uh, some of the other uh, current pre-application deadlines that are out there. So there's a pre-application deadline for ALS on June 22nd, uh, autism uh, July 5th, bone marrow failure July 16th, Gulf War illness on July 13th. Lung cancer, um, most of the awards have their pre-application deadline on June 26th, but the concept award in lung cancer uh, is July 26th. Uh, MS uh, and neurofibromatosis are both July 26th. Ovarian cancer is a day before that, July 25th. Um, as we, you've seen earlier, the peer review cancer research program uh, is uh, June 20th. I'm not sure why I added it here because we discussed it, but regardless, <laughs> uh, prostate cancer, uh, there are two mainly relevant mechanisms. One is July 6th and one is July 9th. Um, Tick-borne disease, June, uh, June 25th, and, and, and tuberous sclerosis, uh, July 11th. Besides these programs, and these are all the pre-applications, so obviously if one of these areas is something that you'd like to engage in research in or try to get funding for your research, uh, obviously look into the, the actual uh, award mechanism and look for when the full application is as well, because you should know that, um, especially since, as I mentioned, there are a few where the pre-application is not competitive, and then typically you won't have a huge amount of time between the pre-application and the full application. Um, additional CDMRPs uh, that should be coming out either in the near future or slightly less near future, but most of them in, in the near future, based on the pre-announcements that the DOD has already issued. So we're looking forward to the orthopedic research, CDMRP, hearing restoration, vision, spinal cord injuries, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, lupus, uh, Duchenne, uh, kidney cancer is one of the more recent pre-announcements that came out. Uh, and also, as I mentioned earlier, there's a breast cancer program that has been issued for, for, for the kind of their spring deadline, but uh, their fall deadline has not been issued yet, and usually that's in November. Um, 
that that's it in terms of the examples I wanted to discuss. Obviously, if you've seen one of the topics here that's relevant for you, I would I would absolutely encourage you to look into it a bit deeper. Uh, for obvious reasons, I'm not going to go through every single award mechanism of every single possible topic. Um, but but I hope I've been able to give you at least a background in terms of what's possible in terms of of how we typically approach it and how to really maximize chances of award. And this is honestly has a lot to do with uh, with the CDMRPs, but also this is this is true in general. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we, we, we try to turn non dilutive funding into a real strategic source of funding for a company. And that's basically adding it to a portfolio of other sources of funding. It could be public markets, VCs, angels or anything else. Um, and we would contend that while it shouldn't absolutely should not replace those, uh, in many cases, it really is a mistake to neglect non dilutive funding because it can absolutely add to that. Um, and, and the way to really ma maximize your chances of an award is to address, you know, possible uh, potholes and know your weaknesses. Uh, absolutely collaborate when necessary. Don't collaborate to collaborate. Uh, there are no requirements to do that. And, and honestly, just putting somebody's name on an application because their name carries some weight is not necessarily a, a smart idea because in many cases they will see through that. But um, if you do have a set of capabilities that you think would add to what your proposal is, by all means go collaborate and go collaborate with the best partner you can find. Um, understand what the agencies are looking for, not just in terms of what's listed on the call, but really what their priorities are, uh, try to discuss with them in advance. We try never to submit an application before we have spoken with them and have tried to get a, a very good understanding of exactly what they're looking for. Rarely, if ever, honestly, uh, will the first time they understand what our clients are proposing be when they read the application. Um, Administrative parts, especially when, when, when the science guys are, are, are submitting the application, uh, it can be viewed as something that's a bit less important than, than, the, than you know, the scientific rationale, the specific aims. And, and to be fair, that's probably true. But on the other hand, something else that's true is that we see applications get disqualified, not with our clients, because <laughs> we take care of that, but applications do get disqualified all the time for administrative uh, uh, reasons. Uh, so it, it's really a shame when that happens and try to make sure you look at everything and, and, and eliminate that possibility because it, 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 absolutely, it absolutely happens and it, it is a shame when it happens. Um, and really have to convey why your your both your research is top notch, but also the structure behind the research is something that they should trust to push that research, research through. Um, and really the way we do that is by we start by identifying all the relevant funding opportunities and CDMRPs in many cases are, are, are part of that. But at this point, I'm talking on a higher level, uh, discussing it in terms of a company's strategy for non dilutive funding. And obviously other additional sources would come into play depending on what they do. Private foundations, NIH, other DOD sources, NSF, BARDA, obviously depending on the specifics. Um, correlate that with the interests of the company, create a multi-submission granting strategy, and then start producing the actual applications, uh, producing as many as possible, but also ma making sure not to produce applications just for the sake of producing an application. Make sure there is a real chance of an award, maximizing each application's chance for success. And by approaching it that way, we are able to make this a, a relatively consistent uh, strategic source of funding. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, at this point, I will try to answer as many questions as I can. If there are questions that are very specific and not necessarily relevant for everyone else, then uh, I'll try to answer them by email. But otherwise, uh, here we go. So let's see what's out there. So um, I suspect there are a few questions here that I actually answered. So I, I, I suspect that they were just submitted before I discussed them. Um, so let me see here. Trying to look for something that I didn't cover. Um, okay. I'll, 
I mentioned this, but I'll, maybe maybe somebody joined in the middle, so, so I'll clarify. Yes, uh, non-U.S. applicants are absolutely welcome to submit. Uh, there are no geographical restrictions. The time frame uh, associated with uh, uh, the full application is usually between the time you're notified that you are uh, invited to submit the full application until the actual deadline is usually two to three months. But look at the specific solicitation, uh, look at the details. It, it will all be listed there to make sure. So because there is, there is some variability. This is a question in general. Uh, yes, this is a kind of general question about non-dilutive funding, but I think it's an interesting one, so I'll try to address it as well. And the question is basically, uh, do, does the chance of success uh, in receiving non-dilutive funding increase if you have already received this type of funding in the past? Um, so statistically, yes, although it's hard to say whether or not that's just because they see the fact that you have been awarded and they, and they like that, because that's, as I mentioned earlier, some type of, of validation. Um, and, or is it the fact that you have fantastic science and therefore your chances of success are generally higher than, than others? Um, probably a bit of the two. Uh, and and uh, is the reverse too? Then no, not necessarily. I mean, obviously, statistically, you know, if you compare the two, if the success rates are higher for people who have been successful or rather organizations that have been successful, then obviously organizations that have not been successful have slightly lower success rates. But it's not – I wouldn't say that it's true that not having been successful in the past is, is a real deterrent uh, to your chances of success. It's really based on the specifics of the project. The amount of awardees is always dependent on the specific program. There are programs with very high dollar amounts, and there there would be more awardees. There are programs with lower dollar amounts, uh, and you can kind of look at the list I, I added at the beginning of the presentation. Um, and, and there would typically be less awardees in areas where there's less funding. But also, you, you, to, to get a real understanding, you should also look at um, – at how that money is allocated, meaning if each award is 200,000, they can give up much more awards than if each award is, is 10 million to be to take it to the extreme. Um, let's see here if there's anything else. So there, there are quite a few questions that are very specific here, and, and, and uh, I'll try to answer them by email. Uh, one more question that I've seen a few times here is, is, is about our business model. Uh, so this obviously it depends on, on the specific client, but generally speaking, um, combination of, of an upfront fee and an award fee, uh, typically, as I indicated earlier, we take on a client for a long period of time and, and we take a multi-submission strategy. Uh, so you, it's usually uh, not a fee for per application, but just for a period of time and then an award fee. Um, what that, those fees are, as I mentioned, really depends on the size of the company, the size of the pipeline, the, you know, expected scope of activities, and I'm happy to discuss that with anybody who thinks that's relevant. Um, but that's basically the model. Uh, let me see here. I think that pretty much covers most of the questions. Um, I will try to answer as many of the additional very specific ones as I can via email. Uh, but that aside, I'd like to thank you all very, very much for attending today. Uh, it was a pleasure. Uh, and feel free to reach out. My email is on the last slide. So feel free to reach out with any additional questions. But regardless, thank you for joining. Uh, and uh, come join us for our next webinar. Thank you.